and I will be your host today. I'm a marketing manager at Extreme Engineering. I hope everybody is safe and healthy. And um, let me uh, introduce our speaker today. I have the great pleasure to present you, Dr. Isam Dogri. Hi, Isam. Can you hear me? Oh, hi. Hi, Mira. Yes, can you? Yes. Perfect. I hear you as well clearly. So, um, today, uh, we are going to hear about ICME, which acronym stands for Integrated Computational Materials Engineering. And um, it is a modeling chain which links uh, manufacturing process, materials microstructure, some engineering properties, and its performance of the products made with. Uh, Isam is going to talk about this much deeper than I am. So, in the meantime, while I'm passing the control over to Isam to share his slides, let me introduce him a little bit. So, Professor Dogri is a tenured professor at University Catholic de Leuven and a co founder and chief scientific advisor of Extreme Engineering, part of Manufacturing Intelligence Division. Isam's professional experience is both in academia and industry, as we see. His expertise is on nonlinear mechanics of solid materials and structures, and his research activities are in computational mechanics of materials. He's an author of a book and more than 75 or even more scientific papers, and the advisor of several PhD theses and the principal investigator of a number of funded research project projects. He's regularly invited to give talks, such as this one today, so we are really happy to listen to him to learn a lot more about integrated computational material engineering. So, Isam, the floor is yours. You have the floor okay. over the slide. Thank you, Mira. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending this webinar. I hope that you are uh, all safe in these difficult times. And it is really my pleasure to talk to you. Can you hear me well? Yes, the audio is and, and you can, can you see the screen? Okay, the first slide. Okay. Can you see the first slide? No, we don't, don't see it yet, your slide. Please share I, it again. Okay, I try again then. Can you see it now? Can you see it? Can you see can you see the slide, the first slide or not? No, I cannot. Uh, okay. So what can I do? Please try, uh, try to share it yes. again. Uh, share your screen or the PowerPoint is back. Okay. But uh, the attendees yeah. are actually able to see it, so we should be good, but now it's coming. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, hello everybody and thank you for uh, attending this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you, Mira, for the uh, nice introduction. And today I'm going to talk about uh, ICME for polymers and polymer-based composites. Um, uh, I will try to, to give an overview of the subject. Uh, what is ICME? So ICME is, uh, stands for Integrated Computational Materials Engineering, and it is actually a modeling chain which links four pillars. So ICME is based on four pillars. Manufacturing process is the first one, then materials microstructure, materials engineering properties, and finally the performance of final parts. So it links all these four pillars together. Uh, this is uh, a picture which shows the uh, four pillars of the ICME manufacturing process leads to a material microstructure. Material microstructure uh, is, uh, is something that we take in a broad sense. So, for instance, um, uh, residual fields also are uh, considered as being material microstructure. The material microstructure gives rise to the engineering properties properties of the material that engineers will use. And the engineering properties themselves, of course, will play a big role in the part performance. Now, why did we draw a circle here or a loop? Because you can not only link all those pillars, let's say four pillars together, but you can embed all of this, all this chain in an optimization loop so that you can fine-tune the manufacturing process 
and you can also fine tune the microstructure or both of them in order to uh, achieve an optimal part design. So for instance, you can uh, design a part uh, for a given performance while reducing its weight. So uh, we need to say that there is important and huge research work, both research work, let's say scientifically, and also applied research work, work in software development, which exists on each one of the four pillars of ICME and also on the links between them, okay, as I will uh, talk about it uh, in, uh, in a few minutes. And this uh, exists and predates the creation of ICME. So one can ask what is the originality of ICME? Really, ICME is all about the integration of all those uh, aspects, the pillars, the links between them, all of this, and the optimiza optimization of this link. The integration has to be robust and efficient. So uh, ICME needs appropriate mathematical formulation and computational algorithms in order to achieve this robustness, this efficiency. And a nice thing about ICME is that by design, it really uh, about, it is about collaboration and cross fertilization. It is co between it is about collaboration in science between different scientific disciplines. So, for instance, here we have uh, models and we have people working on manufacturing and modeling manufacturing 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 processes. Material science deals with material microstructure. Mechanics of materials deals with material engineering properties. Uh, finite element analysis deals with part performance. So, and then you have optimization, multi-scale modeling, and we talk about it. All these scientific fields uh, are linked together by ICME. So it really um, encourages and nurtures the uh, collaboration between different scientific disciplines. Also in industry between different departments within a company, the departments which deal with design or which deal with uh, the materials or with FEA uh, uh, usually are, uh, do not communicate too well between each other. And ICME makes this communication, and this dialogue uh, possible. And also uh, it emphasizes collaboration between different companies. So uh, typically, for instance, between material suppliers and end users in uh, different industries. And uh, in, uh, on the software side, ICME also, and in, in order to work, it needs the seamless uh, integration of various software products, because there are software products which deal with manufacturing process simulations and different uh, software for different processes, software for homogenization, different software products for FEA, for optimization, etc. In order for the ICME chain and optimized chain to work together, all these software products, usually coming from different software providers, need to communicate uh, together in a seamless fashion. So about the history and the references of ICME, I'm not going to say who uh, invented it first, so uh, who invented the, the acronym first, but there are some uh, important references. So in the US, uh, we need to cite the uh, papers and publications by John uh, Allison, who was with Ford uh, Motor and uh, is now at the University of Michigan, and also books and papers by uh, Professor Horst Mayer, uh, who is in Mississippi, and the Materials Genome Initiative. And in Europe, uh, we need to, to, to read and cite books by, uh, edited by uh, uh, professors Schmidt and Prahl, and there are also lots of activities and publication by a group called the ICMEG group. And there are conferences, the Fifth World Congress on ICME, the Second Workshop on Software Solutions, as well as review papers. Most of these references and uh, let's say the history of ICME uh, deals with metals mainly. For polymers and polymer-based composites, I can say, I think, without, uh, without hesitation, that TGMAT, which was developed by uh, Extreme Engineering, was the first comprehensive ICME platform. platform. 
So this match started in 2003 with ICME for reinforced plastics, which are manufactured with injection molding. And then today, Digimat also offers ICME for continuous fiber reinforced composites and also for the additive manufacturing of polymers, either in the reinforced or reinforced polymers. And then uh, at the end of my talk, uh, I will talk, I will present briefly uh, a key uh, component for a successful industrial deployment of ICME. This is something that has been developed by Extreme Engineering, MC Software, and Hexagon, and it is called the 10X Initiative. Okay, so uh, as I said, ICME is it's about linking manufacturing process, material microstructure, material engineering properties, and part performance. So let me talk uh, first by uh, manufacturing process, material mi microstructure, and most importantly, the link between them. Okay? In order to uh, illustrate that, I will, uh, uh, during all the talk, I will take, I will consider two examples. So the first example is about the injection molding of reinforced plastics. I guess that uh, most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with this topic. So um, uh, this is uh, this is a schematic of uh, an injection molding uh, manufacturing process. So um, uh, here you have um, you have a barrel. You enter into this barrel thermoplastic pellets and chopped glass fibers. Here you have a screw, helical screw, which uh, rotates around its axis. And the uh, mixture here will, uh, will enter the screw. Uh, this, uh, 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 this is heated up, so the polymer is molten. And then through, an, uh, through gates, uh, it enters the mold. So it fills the mold with the uh, shape of the desired final part. And then when we co cool the mold down, um, we, we obtain the design of, uh, desired part. So the basis for the modeling of this manufacturing process is a very old solution by uh, Jeffrey in 1922, who developed a solution for the motion of a single ellipsoidal fiber in a Newtonian fluid. But uh, of course, we, we don't have a single fiber. We have in each small volume several fibers. So and there is an interaction between them. So the solution has to be extended, and it has been extended uh, approximately because the problem becomes extremely complicated by several uh, workers. And uh, the, the most, uh, let's say, or among the most cited ones and remarkable works are the models by Tucker and his co-workers. And the main prediction of these uh, models is that. Uh, they are able to predict what is called the orientation tensors, second rank orientation tensors. And the orientation tensors, and I will come back to it a little bit later, uh, are basically a measure of the fiber orientation in each small volume. So this microstructure that you get from uh, this process, and uh, there are models which are able to predict it. So uh, uh, this is... Uh, this is an example of uh, an injection molding of uh, reinforced plastic part. So this is the animation, and you see how the part is filled. And uh, as I said, the resulting microstructure of this process is that in each small volume, you have a short fiber reinforced composite. So this is an experimental uh, image. Of, uh, of what we obtain experimentally. So you see that we have in a small volume, lots of fibers which don't have the same orientation and don't have the same length. And these are numerical images of the microstructures that you, you obtain. So this is, uh, this is a 3D uh, representative volume element. I will uh, come back to it later. And actually what happens, so you see that you have lots of short fibers which uh, are more or less randomly dispersed in a, in a representative volume element, but they don't have the same orientation, they don't have the same length. And actually, if the part is thick enough, then you will also have uh, 
distributed orientations through the thickness. So this is what is called the skin core effect. So the fibers are misaligned in, uh, let's say, this top layer, and then the misalignment is different in the middle layer, and then again, it's different in the bottom layer. So as I said, I mean, the manufacturing process, we can uh, model it and it is able to predict these micro structures. Actually, it doesn't predict directly the uh, distributed orientations of the fiber, but as I said, it, it, it predicts the, what is called the second order uh, orientation tensor. So if P, for instance, is the uh, direction of a singular fiber, and the psi of P is the probability of finding fibers within a certain orientation P. This is also called the orientation distribution function. And this is the definition of the components of the second uh, order um, orientation tensor. And um, um, as I said, it is a measure of the average orientation in a representative volume element. And if you take uh, some special cases, if the component 1, 1 is equal to 1, that means that all fibers are, are aligned in the, uh, in the one direction. If uh, component 2, 2 is equal to 1, that means that all fibers are aligned in the y direction. And if the component is equal to 0.5, that means that the fibers are randomly um, oriented parallel to a plane. And you have all intermediate cases. Okay? Now I take another example uh, of a manufacturing process and the resultant microstructure that it creates and that we are able to uh, numerically predict is additive manufacturing of polymers by a process which is called the selected laser centering, which is one of the most popular, uh, most used uh, processes in, uh, uh, in the additive manufacturing of polymers. So this is a schematic representation of the uh, of this process. So uh, you have uh, uh, you have the polymer which is in the form of powder. So you you put a layer a layer by layer uh, of this uh, polymer powder, and then you have a laser beam laser laser beam which will uh, heat up the part that you want to print at the end. Okay. And so, for instance, let's say that you hit this uh, small volume here, so the powder will, will melt, and then the uh, heat source, the laser, will move uh, away, and it will heat up another part. And once it is done with this uh, layer, then we add another layer, and the laser moves on again. So we have to solve thermal problem, which is, uh, which is a thermomechanical problem, and this is schematic of the heat problem. So the heat problem is already quite complicated. So here there is a picture uh, of the heat source. And uh, here you have radiation convection phenomena. And then uh, the printed part will interact uh, by conduction with the, uh, with the powder, surrounding powder. And also you have boundary conditions on the lateral faces and on the powder bed button. So this is uh, a numerical simulation of the uh, uh, selected laser centering of the part. And actually, it is the same part, which is printed twice with different printing orientation. This will become uh, clear uh, once we are done with this animation here. So um, uh, these are uh, numerical simulations by uh, Dijimak AM. And as I said, I mean, we, uh, we, we model the process of adding the uh, uh, polymer powder layer by layer, and then the motion and action of the laser. And what you can, but you also have to solve a thermomechanical problem, not just the heat problem. So in uh, uh, the, the, first, the first, let's say, modeling assumption that one makes is that the um, uh, constituent model, for instance, thermoelasticity or thermoviscoelasticity, is a homogeneous model. Okay, so, so we assume that we have a homogeneous model, thermoelastic or uh, or thermoviscoelastic, and then we couple the heat equation with the uh, 
uh, with the mechanical problem, assume thermoelasticity or thermoviscoelasticity, and we uh, are able to simulate the process and then also the uh, parts at the end of the process. And as I said, these are two parts, uh, same parts, but they are produced with different printing uh, directions. And we will see uh, at the end that the printing direction has an important role on the performance of the final part. So these two parts will not behave in the same way. If we take a homogeneous material model, uh, and we do the simulation with it, we are not able to, uh, to take into account something which is known to be important for the uh, uh, SLS of thermoplastic polymers, which is that the crystallinity distribution, there is a crystallinity distribution, so the crystallinity is not uh, homogeneously distributed over the part, and this heterogeneous distribution of crystallinity plays an important part on the performance of the final part. So therefore, if you only use a homogeneous model, that will not do the, uh, the job. So what we did recently, there are different ways to introduce a certain uh, microstructural uh, effect. So one of them is to really consider the, uh, is to consider the powder as grains and then to model the interaction between those grains. And, uh, but we did uh, something, um, uh, something different which is um, a, phase field, a phase field model coupled with, uh, with the heat equation problem. So uh, let me show you this animation here, and, and then I will talk a little bit uh, more about that. So we uh, simulate the, uh, the uh, transformation of the powder material with a phase field model coupled with heat equation. So uh, in this animation, you see that, okay, let me repeat it. We start in, in each small volume. We start by, so we start with the polymer as a molten fluid, and then we nucleate. Uh, we create a number of nucleation sites. That's what you see here. And then the phase field model, what is the phase field model? Actually, uh, there are two phases. It starts with the um, fluid phase, and then the fluid phase, little by little, so with the effect of temperature, it will transform in a solid phase. So you have a field variables, which takes values zero and one. And there is also an interface, which, uh, where the value between the two phases, where the value varies continuously between zero and one. So what you see here, uh, let, let, me, let me look at the end here of the simulation. What you see in, uh, in uh, uh, is the creation of spherulites. And spherulites have two phases, amorphous phase and crystalline phase. In black, what you see is the prediction of the amorphous phase. And what you see in yellow here is the prediction of the crystalline phase. And actually you have experimental data on the crystallization of thin filaments. And the numerical simulation uh, actually is very, very close to the experimental results. So as I said, when you take this phase field, phase field model and you couple it with the heat equation, heat equation, you are able to predict the microstructure. The microstructure is a semi-crystalline polymer. It contains amorphous and crystalline phases. And then we, uh, we know experimentally that the crystallinity distribution has an important influence on the final properties. So by modeling, we will be able to predict this influence on the final performance path. Okay. So uh, now uh, I talked about manufacturing, about material microstructure. As I said, I mean material micro and the link between them. And as I said, in material microstructure, if you have, I mean, the process induces residual fields such as uh, residual stresses. And if you are able to, uh, to, to predict them with good accuracy, then they, they, they are also part of what I call here material microstructure. And you will be able to take it into account in order to uh, model the uh, engineering properties and the part performance, et cetera. OK, so now I'm going to talk about the link between the material microstructure and the engineering properties. 
So uh, in order to do that, we need to, uh, to, to, to have something which is called a representative volume element. So what is a representative volume element? I mean, as its name indicates, it represents the microstructure. So it has to be large enough to contain sufficient statistical information about the microstructure so that it can give us engineering properties. But it has to be small enough compared to the size of the body in order to have scale separation, which is always needed uh, when you do multi-scale modeling or scale bridging, homogenization, etc. Of course, I mean, if you have simple microstructures, which are by definition periodic, then you just take one uh, periodic unit cell and you apply periodic model conditions. But the problem becomes more interesting if you have microstructures like the ones that I showed earlier, short fiber reinforced composites or semi-crystalline polymers in, uh, obtained uh, in, in an additive manufacturing process of polymers, for instance. These are called uh, quote unquote random microstructures when you don't see the periodic unit cell which repeats itself. So the notion of the representative volume element becomes very really crucial in this case. So uh, we take a representative volume element, and uh, I will uh, I will talk uh, a bit more about it later. And uh, let's say this is our representative volume element containing uh, heterogeneous microstructures. For instance, some fibers or some inclusions embedded in matrix, or it couldn't be the semi-crystalline uh, microstructure that I showed. So this is a heterogeneous microstructure, uh, and it is subjected to some boundary conditions. And what we want to do is to replace this with a homogeneous uh, uh, volume element, which has the same geometry and which is subjected to the uh, same uh, boundary condition. This is really what we want to do because this homogenized uh, volume element will allow us to define what we call the engineering properties or the effective properties of the material. And we can show that going from here to here means that we are able to relate the volume average of the stress field inside this volume element that is, called, that is called the micro uh, stress field to the volume average of the strain field inside the volume element that is called the micro strain field. So homogenization going from here to here is about relating the volume average over the RVE of the stress field and the volume average of the R over the RVE of the strain field. And there is a nice physical interpretation about that, at least in linear elasticity. Uh, replacing, let's say, this heterogeneous RPE with this homogeneous one means that the uh, strain energy or the elastic energy of this homogenized RPE is equal to the volume average of the strain energy at the micro level. Now you will see and hear a lot of terms which are almost similar, uh, which are similar, but they are not identical. So we talk about scale bridging, multi-scaling, homogenization, micromechanics. So scale bridging is, is really very general, and you can use it uh, every time you, you, you bridge uh, different uh, physical uh, or space scales or time scales. Multi-scaling, we can also uh, use it basically for the same purpose, although in some cases, some people would only use multi-scaling if you uh, do the scaling between different physics. Uh, I will talk about it a little bit later. Uh, homogenization and micromechanics, um, some people use, I mean, homogenization, um, micromechanics uh, is homogenization if you use, let's say, some analytical models, okay? And homogenization will be more, more general than micromechanics because it will be any, uh, any, uh, any scale transition model uh, method in continuum mechanics. So I will basically only talk about homogenization or, or let's say micromechanics in the sense that we will be using continuum mechanics at every level. 
So at this micro level, or sometimes people will call it meso level, etc. Let's say you have multiple levels, fine scales, and and uh, and let's say coarser ones, and we will be using continuum mechanics at every scale. So we can talk about that's what we uh, talk here, uh, and we can talk about continuum micro mechanics. Okay, so it's a question of terminology. Now uh, I said that. Uh, we need to have representative volume elements and we apply some boundary conditions uh, here. But we need to make sure that we really have representative volume element. So this is a schematic of uh, how it can be measured, if you like. Let's say that this is the effective response, okay? Um, for instance, this is the uh, effective Young's modulus. This is the homogenized Young's modulus that you obtain by, let's say, experimentally. This is an exact result. And, um, and this is, uh, uh, you, you take cells and you increase the cells and you also uh, apply different boundary conditions. So let's say you take a cell uh, or, of a given size and you apply displacement boundary conditions to it. You get this prediction of the macroscopic response, let's say the macroscopic Young's models. So you see that you are far off from the uh, exact response, let's say. If you apply periodic boundary conditions, you are closer, okay? And if you apply uniform traction boundary conditions, you are far from the response. If you increase the cell size, then eventually all boundary conditions will lead to the same response and will converge to the effective response. However, you see that for a given cell size, the periodic boundary conditions is always closer to the uh, uh, exact effective response. And also that periodic boundary conditions converge uh, faster to the actual size of the representative volume element. So that's why we rec recommend using periodic boundary conditions, even if the microstructure is random quote and quote and is not periodic. Now, uh, how do you find this homogenized response here? There are basically two classes of methods, full field methods and uh, mean field methods. So in full field methods, what you do is that you, uh, you take your, your representative volume elements, you apply your, the periodic model conditions, you uh, solve for the detailed fields everywhere in the RVE, and then you compute the volume average of the stress field and the strain field, and that's how you uh, achieve the homogenization. This is an example here, uh, obtained by Nishimate Phi on a 2D random orientation of short glass fiber polyamide composite. And you see here, it's, uh, uh, the homogenization was, was done by uh, full field finite elements. And the, uh, for each realization, because since you have random position, actually what you should do is several realization and then you take the ensemble average of the realization. For each realization, we needed, we, we needed 245 fibers in order to have an RVE and we had 450, uh, 400,000 second order tetrahedra. The advantages of full field finite elements homogenization is it, uh, it is very general. You can, uh, you can handle any uh, microstructure. It is extremely accurate uh, if you take, of course, I mean, all the right precautions at the macroscopic and microscopic levels. But of course, there is no, no, no free lunch. And the drawbacks of no free meal uh, uh, are that you have meshing difficulties for realistic microstructures and the CPU time can become extremely large, especially for nonlinear problems. So there is another full field method, which, is, uh, which has the advantage of not of working even for complex microstructures, because you don't need conforming meshes. So you, you, you need to uh, grids, basically, so a regular grid. So you discretize the microstructure into simple cells, uh, either 2D pixels or 3D voxels. And each uh, pixel or each voxel belongs to one material or another. So you see here, 
we have uh, grids for um, uh, circular fibers, uh, continuous fibers, the cross section embedded in the matrix. And we see that, okay, the advantage, of course, is that you don't have uh, to do a meshing, it's just a simple regular grid. But the uh, drawback is that you won't respect the uh, correct interface, so you don't have here a circular, uh, circular boundary of your uh, cross section of uh, the fibers. And uh, unless you try to, uh, to, to approach it by increasing the number of grids. But if you increase the number of grids, of course, you increase the CPU time, and it then becomes comparable to finite element full fill. However, there is a method, a very powerful method called FFT for fast Fourier transform. Uh, it is based on uh, rewriting the problem in the Fourier space. And if you do that, then you can uh, reduce the CPU time with respect to uh, finite elements by at least a factor of 10. So this is an example here taken from uh, Digimat. So we have a Digimat FE solver, and we also have Digimat F15. <clears throat> and this is an example of the short fiber reinforced composite. This is volume element here in a uh, nonlinear non case. Okay. And uh, let me just show uh, so you see the effective stress versus the effective strain, and you have those nonlinear curves. Um, I will compare two results. So uh, the finite element result and the uh, FFT result, which is the closest to it. Okay? So for the same accuracy as finite elements, that's comparing the uh, blue curve and the gray curve here. This dotted curve is the experimental curve. So uh, the, the uh, gray curve is the uh, FFT. Uh, no, the gray curve is the finite element simulation. And the uh, dark blue curve, they're very close to each other. So from bottom to top, it's the second curve and the third curve. They're close to each other, but if you use FFT, then the uh, speed up factor in CPU time on the same exact same uh, computational platform is equal to 14. So the FFT speed up with respect to FE with the same accuracy as FE on this nonlinear problem is equal to 14. Now there is another homogenization method, which is uh, extremely cheap, much, much cheaper than uh, these two methods, and it is called mean field homogenization. Uh, so uh, the idea behind mean field homogenization is that instead of trying to solve for the detailed uh, microfields of stress and strain and then uh, linking the uh, volume averages on these uh, microfields. No, you, you don't compute them, but you make assumptions on the volume averages of those fields. You make assumptions, for instance, on the volume average of the strain, the inclusion, with respect to the macroscopic strain. Okay? So uh, uh, this way of doing things, uh, called midfield homogen homogenization, is based on a fundamental solution Again, it's an old solution found by a great scientist called John uh, Eshelby, 1957, linear elasticity. They found the uh, exact solution for an ellipsoidal inclusion embedded in an infinite matrix. And from that, there are, uh, uh, let's say, approximate models which take uh, in an approximate fashion the interaction between, uh, between fibers. So you have the Mori Tanaka model, the self-consistent model, et cetera, the double inclusions model. It's somehow similar to, uh, you have, and uh, I talked about injection molding all earlier, you have a, a solution by uh, Jeffrey for a single uh, fiber in, uh, in uh, Newtonian fluid. And then if you have multiple fibers, you have some, uh, some, some models which are approximate. And here it's similar, okay? You have the HLB solution if you have a single uh, ellipsoid and then the matrix, and then you have approximate models which take into account approximately for the effect of the interaction between multiple fibers. The advantages uh, of these methods are extremely easy to use, no meshing, no grid, 
uh, the CPU time is extremely, extremely small. To give you just an idea, if you take uh, uh, even a nonlinear material model for each phase, and it's very complicated, it will take a few uh, seconds of CPU time on a laptop like mine, which is not an extremely powerful one. It is, uh, mean, it is extremely accurate in linear thermoelasticity, linear viscoelasticity, but of course, I mean, it has also drawbacks. You don't get the detailed uh, stress and strain fields in each phase, which is a problem if you want to to, to, to predict uh, uh, damage or strength uh, uh, in general. The extension to nonlinear problems is quite challenging, extremely challenging. And the limitation uh, is that the shape uh, of the inclusions or the fibers, etc., they or the porosities, the cavities, they all have to be approximated by ellipsoids. Let's see an example here. Uh, uh, we have a short fiber reinforced thermoplastic and uh, elastoplasticity. The fibers are elastic, but the matrix is considered here an elastoplastic. We consider that the fibers are aligned, uh, and we consider two cases: uh, uh, tension along the fiber direction and tension, and tension perpendicular to the fiber direction. And here we have the macroscopic stress versus the macroscopic strain. Uh, this is the response of the N-reinforced matrix, and these are different predictions of the response of the composite. So the reference solution is the finite element solution. Okay, this is, uh, these are the dots here, and uh, he, they, these are uh, uh, predictions by mean field models, uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, approximations, and you see that in this case, the best one is the uh, uh, blue one. If you uh, look at the tension test in the, uh, in the other direction, the direction transfers to the fibers, then again, this is the response of the energy enforced matrix. Uh, the dots are the uh, finite element results. This is our reference when we, uh, when we try to uh, uh, verify midfield uh, models. And the predictions of the midfield model, in this case, they are all close to each other and close to the finite element results. Actually, this case of short fibers, which means an aspect ratio length over diameters of fibers of the order of 20, let's say, is, uh, is, uh, is different from continuous fibers. So in continuous fibers, it is very easy to, uh, to find the, uh, the response in the, uh, in the fiber direction, and it is basically given by a void model. But here, it is extremely difficult to predict the response in the fiber direction. And it can be seen here by this map, uh, the contours of accumulated plastic strain in the matrix. So you see that we have uh, lots of heterogeneities and concentrations of this accumulated plastic strain field in the matrix. While if you, uh, uh, if you uh, do a tensile test in the transverse direction, then you have much more homogeneous fields in the matrix. And again, the situation is completely opposite to uh, what happens for continuous fibers. For continuous fibers, it's more difficult to predict the response in the transverse direction. Uh, let me uh, take the uh, uh, other example, uh, which is microstructures uh, created by additive manufacturing of polymers by the SLS. So I showed an animation earlier when we start by uh, putting a certain uh, uh, number of nucleation in a representative volume element. And then the phase field model and the heat equation model coupled together, they act and they, uh, they are able to, uh, to predict the spherulite creation over time. So you go here from left to right, you increase the time, and then we go here to the bottom and we increase the time. And this is uh, at the end of the process, the process, the microstructure that you get. Okay? So we take a representative volume elements. So we put uh, 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 a big uh, number of nucleation in a big enough uh, volume. And then we can compute and predict the uh, engineering properties of this uh, semi-crystalline microstructure. So for instance, we uh, get the Young's modulus as a function of the crystallinity ratio. So uh, we have here, and this is, as I said, I mean, the distribution of crystallinity is important in practice, and we would like to predict it. And this is what we do. So uh, here we have uh, the Young's modulus, 
as a function of the crystallinity ratio. We have experimental data. The experimental data are the um, crosses, the black crosses, and the um, green and uh, green uh, squares and the red the triangles. And the prediction with uh, the enhanced face shield model that we developed and, uh, and the results that we obtained with the DigiMat FFT uh, full field simulation software are in, um, in this blue curve here, okay? So you see that this blue curve goes uh, right, let's say, in the, uh, in the middle of this uh, cloud of experimental data. So a very satisfying uh, prediction. Now, as I said, I only talk about multi-scale modeling using continuum mechanics at every level. So it's what we call, let's say, continuum micromechanics or continuum homogenization, if you like. But of course, we can go to finer scales. We can go to the uh, atomistic scale. Uh, we can go coarse modeling at the, uh, of, uh, of uh, atoms. We can go, we can do molecular dynamic simulations. These are pictures uh, obtained from uh, the J Octa software. There is, there is uh, there are other software which are able to, to work at the uh, atomistic or the molecular dynamics level, like uh, Schrodinger, for instance. And it is able to predict engineering properties with this kind of approaches, but so far, uh, and, and uh, to my knowledge, uh, you can have, let's say, reliable predictions of linear engineering properties. So linear elastic constants, uh, linear coefficients of thermal expansion, and you can take these linear properties and you can feed them to, uh, to uh, let's say, a more uh, continuum mechanics, uh, homogenization-based approach, like the ones I talked about. And there's also the possibility to use this kind of software to predict the properties of nanocomposites and hopefully also to predict properties of interfaces interface between fiber and matrix, for instance, okay? But the, the, the opportunity is there, and we do link, uh, let's say, the Digimat, which is based on continuum micromechanics, with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, lower level, uh, uh, deeper level, let's say, uh, uh, physics and approaches. And this is what uh, uh, people call multi-scaling, it's uh, between different scale, uh, scale, um, let's say, space scales, time scales, and uh, and also different physics. So if you go from the scale of engineering properties down to these scales, you are linking different physics, uh, for instance, continuum mechanics and molecular dynamics, different uh, space scales, length scales, and different time scales. Okay, so now I come to the fourth pillar of ICME, which is the part performance. So we talked about how the manufacturing process leads to uh, material microstructure, how the material microstructure leads to engineering properties, how we are able to model all these and link them together. And then now the uh, final pillar is part performance. So if we link material engineering properties, let's say in part performance, then we, uh, we, we will be able to see the influence of the manufacturing process, the material microstructure, the engineering properties on the part performance. We can also go directly from the material microstructure to the part performance without going through material engineering properties, as I will explain. Um, in a, moment, in a moment. So this is, uh, this is a picture of how you do a two-scale simulation of a composite structure, composite in a broad sense. So it can be, uh, as I explained, I mean, uh, a part uh, obtained by injection molding of uh, short fiber reinforced composite. It could be, it could be, uh, it could be a part um, by uh, obtained by additive manufacturing of polymers or reinforced polymers. Also, this is something that we are able to do. 
It could be a part uh, made of a continuous fiber reinforced composite, and they didn't have time to talk about it today. So this is really a general procedure. So you have the part here at the macroscopic level. That's the uh, level of the part. It could be, let's say, the size here could be uh, a meter, for instance, or several meters. Okay? And uh, uh, we do a finite element. Uh, uh, we have a finite element model at this macroscopic level. So uh, typically, we need a finite element mesh here. And the, uh, uh, we apply boundary conditions, etc. Uh, and then when we run the procedure, the uh, finite element, uh, the macroscopic level, the finite element model at this macroscopic level needs information from the element level. So uh, it passes information to the element. The uh, information basically is the nodal displacement okay, for each uh, at each element. And then what it wants back from the uh, element are the internal forces and the element stiffness. Now the element has integration points on it. This is where the, uh, the uh, stresses will be computed. So the uh, element level will communicate on each integration point with the material. It will pass to the material, typically strain increments, uh, material state variables, state variables describing the, the, the state of the uh, material. And then what it needs from the material is to compute back stresses and material stiffness. Okay? So at the material level, uh, in order to compute the stress and the material stiffness, there are basically two approaches. The first one is to say, OK, the, each integration point actually hides the microstructure beneath it. Each integration point is the center of a representative volume element, which has microstructure. For instance, matrix reinforced by fibers or um, semi-crystalline uh, polymer microstructure. So by homogenization, so we take this representative volume element, we apply, for instance, periodic boundary condition, and by homogenization, which relates the volume average of stress and the volume average of strain of each RBE, we compute the stress and the material stiffness, and we return it back to the element level. This is done by homogenization could be full-field homogenization or mill-field homogenization, like in this slide here. Or we, uh, we can say, OK, here at each integration point, actually, I have macroscopic material model, elastoplastic, elastoviscoplastic, viscoelastoplastic, et cetera. And this macroscopic material model will uh, take the strain increments in the state variables and will return stresses and material stiffness. This is the classical approach. So the, uh, what we want to do in the, in the, in the multi-scale simulation is, of course, to go through this approach is for each integration point, say that we have a hidden microstructure and we compute the homogenized response for this microstructure at each integration point. However, in terms of CPU time and also memory usage, this can become problematic. So if you take this, if you go back to injection molding or reinforced plastics as an example. So we said that the um, uh, microstructure is a uh, lot in each volume element. You have a lot of fibers which do not have the same orientation and the same length. And if the part is thick enough, then also these uh, different microstructure differ through uh, the sub-volume, let's say, from sub-volumes through the thickness. Now, if you inject even a simple dumbbell like that, if you take small volume here, you will have uh, orientation fi uh, fiber, uh, orientation distribution function and the length distribution function. So you'll have, let's say, microstructure like that. And here you will have also another UDF and another LDF, microstructure, let's say, like that. But those microstructures will be different. Okay? So actually, what you are having 
even in a simple geometry like that, is a, a material which is strongly heterogeneous throughout the part and strongly anisotropic throughout the part. So if you, uh, you want here at the micro level at each integration point, you solve the underneath uh, uh, microstructure with full field method, it becomes extremely costly. And this is, by the way, what is called Fe square if you use full field finite elements at the, uh, at the, uh, at the RVE level, at the micro level. Um, actually, it is so expensive that it is unrealistic to do um, Fe square, let's say, uh, method for real parts, let's say, especially in the nonlinear regime. Also, if you use FFT at the micro level, it is still too expensive. And sometimes what happens is that even midfield homogenization at the micro level can be expensive. So that's why it is advantageous, and uh, this is what we have also in DigiMat, to use this approach here, but the, the having a microscopic material uh, model at each integration point, but in an intelligent way. So what we do is that from micromechanics and uh, reprocessing phase, we identify a certain number of appropriately, uh, let's say, chosen material models at different locations. We identify them from the microstructure, and then we can run the, uh, let's say, the classical approach with automatically and appropriately identified material models in different uh, parts of the uh, final structure. Let me show you a few examples here. So this is the part uh, obtained by injection molding. Actually, it goes, uh, it's a technical part which goes under the hood of a car. And this is a, a final uh, um, uh, crash test uh, on this uh, car and, uh, and on this, uh, on this part, uh, SFRC part, short fiber reinforced composite part. And uh, you see here, we have the load versus the displacement in this test here. And the experimental result is, this, uh, is the black curve, okay, the black one, okay, this one, the black one. And here you have uh, different predictions by different versions of uh, Digimat. And you see that the predictions have improved over the versions. So the, the version 5.1.2, for instance, is the red curve. And then the 2016 version, the green curve, 2018 version now is very close, uh, very close to this test. So this is really an example which takes into account everything from the processing through the microstructure, the homogenization, the, mul the multiscale modeling of the final part. And you see the validation against uh, experimental results on, uh, on, the, on the crash test. Now, this is an example I showed uh, animation uh, of the manufacturing process of this part earlier. It's, uh, 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 here the title is not, is not correct, I'm sorry. This is about additive manufacturing, it's not injection molding. So this is the part which was uh, obtained by injection molding. Uh, and uh, okay, yeah, so this is the correct title. Let me just correct here on the spot. Okay, let's remove this if I can. Okay. Yes, so this is a part that uh, I showed an animation of the, each manufacturing by additive manufacturing earlier. And I said that I showed two examples where the part was printed uh, in, two, uh, in two printing directions. Here, actually, this is a material provided, center line material provided by Solvay. And actually, here we have a, a simulation of the manufacturing using different printing angles from zero degrees to 90 degrees. And we see the influence of the uh, printing angle on the performance of the final part. So uh, this is what we see here. This is the pressure of, at break in the part as a function of the printing angle. And we would like to maximize the pressure break. 
And we see that the maximum pressure is obtained for a printing angle around uh, zero degrees, while uh, the uh, performance decreases if you increase the printing angle. And uh, that's what you get here. You have the printing angle at 90 degrees. Okay. So uh, uh, it, it, it really uh, shows you what uh, ICME can do for you. I mean, you can see that you can really uh, simulate the process, and then you can fine-tune the process, as I said in the in the in the beginning. And if you fine-tune the process, you influence the microstructure and you influence the fine the performance of the final part. So you can uh, fine-tune the process and the microstructure in order to obtain to obtain the performance that you want uh, and uh, and uh, at uh, at reduced cost also or reduced weight. Now, uh, I talked about the uh, uh, ICME uh, concept and uh, the, the linkage between four different pillars. But uh, in order for this uh, concept to thrive industrially, it needs really to have an ecosystem. And this is what uh, uh, we uh, have been developing at the Extreme Engineering, MSC Software, and also Hexagon. Uh, it is an ecosystem called the TENX. Uh, 10x solution for ICME. So um, uh, you see that uh, it takes into account uh, different factors because uh, homogenization or multi scale modeling or finite element uh, analysis or modeling the manufacturing process, I mean, on themselves on, and by themselves are not sufficient if you really want to have this uh, concept to be used in industry and to be, let's say, uh, uh, to help really uh, design uh, optimized parts in industry. So uh, other things that need to be taken into account, uh, you need to maintain the quality, you need to think about sustainability. Uh, of course, I mean, the, uh, the how you are going to manufacture the parts, the materials you are going to use, you are worried about having certain performance, you are worried about the cost, you want to reduce the weight, et cetera. So the ICME solution uh, that we uh, propose for industry is based on this uh, 10x uh, platform. So the first one is the virtual material development. I think that I am running out of time. So uh, uh, I, 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 I talk about virtual material. Basically, I talked about virtual material uh, development and also in some sense virtual material testing in some sense. So you, uh, I talked about it, but not a lot. So you can do a lot of uh, material testing uh, on computer, and you can predict, for instance, the failure of coupons. Materials life cycle management, I will talk about it a little bit. Material exchange, also we'll talk about it uh, a little bit. Compliance and sustainability. The effect of processing, this is something that I talked about a lot. Accurate material level uh, modeling at uh, every level. So uh, you have a part which is uh, for different parts which are made uh, with different materials. And maybe each one of them is manufacturing by a different process. You have uh, metals with plastic, with composites, etc. So uh, you need to have accurate material modeling for each one. And then virtual engineering. So for instance, here this is crash test on a car and only some parts of the car have been, for instance, uh, manufacturing with uh, injection molding of uh, uh, short fiber reinforced composites. Other parts uh, are uh, from metals, et cetera, or uh, from composites. And you have, uh, you can put all those different uh, parts uh, coming from uh, different manufacturing process using different materials and uh, virtually do the engineering and the crash test on the car uh, on computer. Material intelligence, I will talk about it a little bit, and uh, digital continuity. So uh, number three in the 10X initiative is the material life cycle management. So uh, we, provide, we, pre provide, we provide at, uh, at MSC Software solution called the Material Center, which is able to store, protect, manage, and distribute everything related to materials in, uh, in, in a company, from the manufacturing 
the design. Uh, so for instance, if you want to say, okay, I have uh, uh, that grade of material, I want to know everything about it. So you'll have or the history uh, of, of this material through the company and also the suppliers, uh, what are material properties which are provided, which experimental tests were done on this material or on parts made of this material, which numerical simulations were done, et cetera, et cetera. So all the history is kept there, is managed, and you can, you can retrieve it, you can store it, you can uh, distribute it while protecting your intellectual property. And uh, number four in the 10X initiative, so I'm not going to talk about all the numbers, only on some uh, on which I didn't touch to today, is the material exchange. So uh, uh, when you have a material, uh, uh, let's say a uh, composite, a reinforced plastic, etc., material grade, it is provided by a material supplier, and this is a short list of material suppliers, but it will be used by, let's say, uh, industries in car manufacturing uh, or in other sectors. And uh, this is a short list of material use. So uh, the uh, material supplier can communicate to the material user all, the, all that is needed to write, let's say, a structural analysis of a part with this material. So they will be able to exchange this material data and they can do it in a, in a and, and encrypted in confidential way. So for instance, let's say that you have here a grade of a short fiber reinforced composite and you have identified the uh, 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 multi-scale modeling, homogenization modeling uh, needed for it uh, to be used with uh, Digimat. You can communicate this uh, material data and input file as uh, as an encrypted file to the material user, and they can use this, uh, this uh, material input file to do structural analysis of the part that they will produce with this material. Compliance and sustainability, it is uh, in practice extremely important if you are uh, using or you intend to use or thinking about using uh, a certain material for certain applications to make sure that the, your materials and your products will meet compliance and also sustainability, uh, and, uh, lots of uh, in, environmental, uh, environment, uh, lots of issues about the uh, environment uh, and the sustainability of the materials uh, that you are going to use. Uh, so this is um, done in a partnership with, uh, with, uh, with the high point systems and you see here, for instance, for this example, which is uh, pre-preg, uh, 40 percent, etc., that uh, uh, in compliance, for instance, uh, these uh, uh, there are some things for which uh, there is an error. So it didn't meet the Proposition 65. Uh, it must be a European uh, uh, European re uh, regulation, and it didn't meet uh, the Rich Annex uh, 17, which is also uh, a material uh, regulation in Europe. Material intelligence, I mean, you know that uh, artificial intelligence and data science in general are uh, making a lot of breakthroughs in all aspects of, uh, of uh, life, uh, social life, industry, etc. And uh, here we are uh, interested and we are working on applying data science to materials. So uh, basically, there are many cases, uh, for instance, in the uh, composite coupons uh, uh, testing, you have different uh, kinds of layouts, uh, open hole, uh, closed hole, different loadings, etc. You can uh, end up, if you want to do it experimentally, with hundreds of thousands of uh, data sets, uh, which is extremely expensive. You can uh, replace uh, at least uh, partially with uh, these uh, uh, experimental data sets or the, let's say, experimental campaign with uh, numerical simulation. They will do, uh, let's say, uh, let's say you have uh, tens of thousands of uh, uh, numerical simulation. Now, you have a database which contains a lot of experimental data, lots of, uh, of uh, numerical simulation. And actually, you can not only use uh, these uh, database 
to, uh, let's say, make sense of it and then extract some uh, useful information. But you can also use it to make predictions. So if you can imagine that you, have, you train a system to learn from your database, and this becomes really important for modeling the problems, if you are able to train a database on, uh, on, on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, your system uh, of uh, experimental results, uh, RVE simulations results, other uh, numerical simulation results, and different loadings, and uh, and uh, if uh, then once it learns, it is able to predict other cases. To predict, for instance, for given microstructure, what happens to an, uh, for another loading, or for similar loadings, what what happens to another microstructure, then you will gain a lot, lot of time, uh, CPU time, for instance, in order to do multi-scale simulations. You won't have to to uh, to do, or at least you you can reduce what I explained uh, earlier about how to do multi-scale simulation of parts. And then the uh, final ambition of the uh, 10X uh, initiative is really to have a digital twin of the entire manufacturing line. So you have your entire manufacturing, for your entire manufacturing line, you have a model uh, which uh, uh, which is valid from the initial state where you get the raw materials, let's say, in your factory or your manufacturing line until the final stage where you get your final product out. So that's really the ambition to have a digital twin of the entire manufacturing line. So uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. I ran over time and I now come to the conclusions. I hope that I was uh, able to convey the uh, uh, notion that ICME provides for robust, efficient, and optimized linkage between manufacturing process, materials microstructure, materials engineering properties, and final part performance. ICME uh, emphasizes collaboration and cross fertilization in science, but also in software and also in industry within a single industry and also between industry. ICME enables to innovate and maximize part performance while you reduce the cost and also the design time. It, will, it also makes uh, a possible uh, new design paradigms. And uh, historically, I would say for uh, polymers and polymer-based composites, DigiMath is, uh, was the first. And I think, uh, I'm sure it is still the most comprehensive ICME platforms for polymers and polymer-based composites. And in order to have industrial deployment of ICME, we provide, we provide the, an entire ecosystem called the 10X uh, platform or solution. I would like to thank you for attention. For attention, I apologize for running over time. And if you have any questions, uh, Please uh, don't uh, hesitate to uh, to ask. You can uh, send me uh, emails. Uh, this is my uh, address right uh, here. I don't. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know, Mira, if we have time for uh, questions okay. in the chat, or uh, or we just leave it for uh, email uh, questions. Thank you very much, Isam. I think it was a really deep dive, as promised. It was a great presentation. We hope that you also enjoyed. And we got millions of questions. To be honest, I have no idea which one to choose. So we will actually answer to you in an email on a private basis, one-to-one -to, -one to each of the questions you have asked. Thank you very much for these questions. Uh, and uh, Professor Dogri will answer these questions to you in the next uh, coming days. So please look out for our emails. And thank you very much for attending. And uh, just one thing left. So now we perfectly know what ICM is and how the solution can enable your, your industry and your uh, everyday challenges to help to overcome them. So let me invite you for short 15, 20 minutes little talks called ICME Talks in the next uh, coming couple of weeks. Uh, we have done the first one already, which was an introduction which was more or less the same as what uh, Isam has been presenting now today to us. So now comes the rest, which will uh, support each of the pillars of the 10X ICME solution. So you can learn a bit more about them. 
the next one is coming on the 6th of May uh, about material suppliers empowering your ecosystem with material digital twins. And we will go on and on uh, in the next 12 weeks on every Wednesday at 5 to 5.20 uh, Central European time. So please go on our website, register for the session, one or more as you like and uh, join us for these short talks and listen to our experts and thought leaders uh, of their field. So thank you very much once again. We wish you all the best. Thank you, Isam, for the great presentation. We appreciate uh, it. It was great. And just the last note, it is recorded. So the recording is available uh, after the session and you will receive it in an email uh, to view it online. So stay safe, stay home. Thank you very much for everyone. Thank you, Isam, and bye-bye. Uh, Thank you very much. Stay safe, everybody. Bye. I shall end the session now, Isam. Uh, bye bye. Have a good day for you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.